Good morning and welcome to worship at Mount Carmel. Good morning. Good morning. As we begin our service this morning, I have a few announcements to highlight. The details are in your bulletins, but I'm going to point out a couple things about some of these. First of all, the deadline to get information in for our next newsletter is February 25th. So if you have any information, please get that to Donna Clawson in the church office. Also, Donna loves to, to put in photographs. If you have any photographs to go with your information, she would love to have that. I was just made aware of a project that our youth and um, children's Sunday school program is doing out in the hallway. If you look next to the elevator, you'll see a large bulletin board. And it's a prayer bulletin board. And there are little tags that you can take and put your prayer requests on them. You can make it as general or as, as or specific or as vague as you would like your prayer requests. But you just hang that on the bulletin board and then they'll collect them every so often in prayer. Our church's lunch bunch will next be meeting at the Golden Corral in Frederick, Frederick and that's going to take place on February 22nd at 11.30 a.m. If you plan to attend, please RSVP by emailing Diane Sweeney. Her email address is in the bulletin. It's on Thursday, so okay. Okay. <laughs> so, but in generally, RSVP helps the planning team better prepare. We will be having uh, meetings coming up soon for men's, women's, and youth. Our men's group will meet on Saturday, February 25th at 8 a.m. The ladies will meet, I'm sorry, 24th. The ladies will meet on the 25th at noon or as soon after the 11 o'clock service as possible. And then a planning session to restart our youth group will take place on March 3rd at noon. If you'd like to order Easter flowers, order forms are available in the gathering hall and they are in the documents holder by the events bulletin board out here. Also, forms can be found in the back of the sanctuary and also as you walk into the great room upstairs. Those are all the announcements I have at this time. Does anybody in the congregation have any announcements? <coughs> Don't hear any, so please join me in our responsive call to worship. I ask that you respond to my proclamation by reciting the text in bold. Awesome God. You created all things. Radiant God, you bring light to an often dark world. You bring order to our lives from the state of disorder. You give your love to us throughout all of life's circumstances, even though we sometimes forget that you do. Let us this morning through worship show you our love for you. Our loving parent, who brings us unconditional love, and total forgiveness. Praise be to you, most holy one. Please join me also in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now please stand, if you're comfortable doing so, for our, our opening music selection, which is called God of the Ages, and that is number 698 in your red hymn.
Creed's familiar to most of you. Maybe it's been a while since you've read it. I don't know if it's been a part of the tradition here over the decades, but there are many churches that read it every Sunday, or there are other creeds in the back of the hymnal, and sometimes I use different creeds, but the Apostles' Creed tends to be one that uh, people maybe memorized in confirmation class or had to learn at some point in Sunday school. Uh, but I wanted to read it today, and I realize it's a little tiny up there, but uh, this is also a check of your vision. But let's read together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. On the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, it is an affirmation statement. It was written in the third century. We don't know who the author was. It was affirmed by one of the early church councils. Um, but evidently there were people that didn't like it later on in that century that came up with a longer version called the Nicene Creed at the Council of Nicaea, uh, which says a little bit more. Again, I want to talk over the next six weeks. What is it that we believe? And, and you can see there's a good chunk of it. Half of it talks about Jesus. But there are other things it doesn't say a whole lot about other than to say, I believe. I believe in the Holy Spirit. That's good. What about the Holy Spirit? You know, or I believe in, you know, the, the resurrection of body. Whose body? You know, our bodies? Jesus' body? We don't know. They didn't go into too much detail. And the same way with believing in God it doesn't say a whole lot, but it does say two things. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. So several years ago, Adam Hamilton, as a preacher, wrote a sermon series and a book and a Bible study uh, based on the Apostles' Creed and what it says for us here, and talking about God as the creator of heaven and earth. So over the years when I've had confirmation classes, and we have not had one here in a while, and it's looking <coughs> like it'll be next year when I'll form together the youth group and then figure out who has not been confirmed and let's get a confirmation class going. 
But during confirmation, rather than when I grew up and some of you who nodded your heads had to memorize the Apostles' Creed, I have confirmation classes write their own creeds. And I really want you to think about doing that as well as we go through these next six weeks, as we look at the various things in the Apostles' Creed. I'll say, okay, that's what it said. What do you believe? What is it that you can affirm for yourself, for your faith? Does this explain it completely? If so, I guess you just copy it down. But maybe there's something else you would add to it or something you would change. How would you write down what you believe about God? Now, I realize when I do this, not everybody believes in God. Right? Not even everybody who comes to church on Sunday really believes in God. They might be questioning or wondering. What is it you believe today? And can you write it down? So we're going to kind of do a, a journal, if you will. And each week I'll share with you what I'm writing down. You share with me if you're able. Come back next week and tell me. Again, you can just get done at the sermon and during the dull parts write down what you believe about God. But don't let it stop there, okay? Play with it. Sleep on it. Talk with other people about it. Say, this is what I believe. And they'll ask questions about it. Or they'll say, yeah, but here's what I believe. And what do you think about this? My hope would be by the time you get around the next Sunday and you get back here, you will have begun to write down what it is you believe. I remember doing this with one of my churches way back in Minnesota. In my uh, third year uh, in ministry, I went to be ordained. In order to be ordained in the United Methodist Church at that time, I imagine they still do it, you had to write down your faith. You had to write down your belief. And so there were a number of questions. And they'd say, you know, answer this, answer that. And what do you think about this? What do you believe about that? And, and so I did that. And then I talked with the congregation, saying, this is what I have to do to get ordained. Why don't you do it with me? And so people in that church began to write down what it is they believe. As I talked with some of them when I was back, there were some who still remember that, you know, nearly 40 years ago, writing down what you believe. Well, we're going to talk about that. The word creed is the English version of a Latin word, credo, which is the first word in the creed. Credo, I believe. That's what creed means. It's a belief statement. And there are some churches that lift up the Apostles' Creed. They are called creedal churches. That is, everybody who joins the church has to either memorize and learn it or at least profess that they believe it word for word. So United Methodists, we do not. We're not a creedal church. We have several creeds in the back of the hymnal. I think there's seven of them that uh, I've used off and on in various churches. And we'll probably take a look at some of those as we go through the year. But there's no one creed that says this is what all United Methodists believe. What do you believe? And how did you come to that belief? And realize that, you know, we grow as we grow in our faith. And what we believe today might be different than what it was 10 years ago. And what we believe today might grow and be somewhat different 10 years from now. What is it you believe about God? Begin to think about that as I preach. Begin to think about that. Jot some notes if you want in your bulletin or somewhere. But by next week, if you could, I'd love to hear, what is it you believe about God? Send me an email. Give me a call. Stop into my office. I'd love to hear it. Well, Adam Hamilton, and he has a video series that goes along with his Bible study, and I got to watch the intro to this uh, first one, which is about God. And, and there he has, you know, on a table right behind him at his podium, a cake, a chocolate cake. He said, you know, think about it. And, and it's got a smell, you know, as well. You know, I sure brought one in here. It would have been nice. But, but then we all get hungry. So, you know, he had this cake and he said, you know, suppose, you know, if you don't believe in God as the creator of the heavens and earth, that you just think it all just happened, you know, somehow with, with evolution and somehow with over a period of time, things all tumbled into place. So think about the cake. I mean, you know, you can think about the same thing. You know, maybe all things would have tumbled together at the grocery store or in your closet and would have turned out to be a cake. But you and I know it takes a really good baker to bake a good cake. And so Adam says, you know, I think using that as an illustration, we have a sense that, you know, we maybe just couldn't have gotten this by chance or 
by some other way. It had to have been created. It had to have been made. And, and so that's where we come with the beginning of this creed, that God is a maker. God's a doer, okay? God just didn't sit in heaven thinking about, wouldn't it be nice if? Maybe God did have those thoughts, but at some time, those thoughts moved into actions. And it's my hope that the things that we think, the things that we believe, are also going to lead us into some actions. And how might we follow this God who creates? What is it that we might create? Did you notice we have a new banner today? Right? Becky, we know, is a creator, right? And so we've got a Latin banner. How about the display? Huh? Yeah, Jody does a beautiful job with displays. She asked me, what do you want up on her? I said, well, we're talking about creator of heaven and earth. Let's put an earth up there. So she got out the globe. Right? What do you believe about God? And what does that belief say about you who believes in that God? Over the next six weeks, we're going to take a look at what all we might believe. But it all begins today with what we believe about God. Again, it's very simple in this creed. The other creeds will go on for, you know, a short paragraph. I don't know about you, but I can tell you there's one creed out there that I wanted to share today that you maybe don't know. Well, you know, but you don't know you know. Okay, isn't that fun? There's a creed you know that you don't know you know. And the reason is, is because you only know the creed, you don't know the story behind the creed. I'm hoping you know the name of Robert Fulton. Does that ring a bell? He wrote a book. Well, he actually wrote a little thing, and that thing went viral back before there was viral, I think. All I really need to know. Oh, thank you. I learned in kindergarten. Good. That was the piece. Okay? And, and then he wrote books. Uh, Robert Fulton's the guy. I've got more books of Fulton's. I think he wrote five over his uh, lifetime that he published. And I've got them on my shelf. So if you want to read some of Fulton, come and see me. But he, he says, at the beginning, that statement was really a statement of faith. Right? It was his creed. Listen to this. At the beginning of the book. Each spring, for many years, I set myself to the task of writing a personal statement of faith. A credo. When I was younger, the statement ran on for many pages, trying to cover every base with no loose ends. Sounded like a Supreme Court brief, as if the words would resolve in all conflicts and the meaning of existence would become clear. Okay. But then he said, all I really needed to know about how to live and what to do and how to be, I learned in kindergarten. Wisdom was not at the top of the graduate school mountain, but there, in the sand pile at Sunday school. These are the things I learned. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush. Warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. Live a balanced life. Learn some and think some and draw and paint and sing and dance and play and work every day some. Take a nap every afternoon. When you go out into the world, watch out for traffic. Hold hands and stick together. Be aware of wonder. Remember the little seed in the styrofoam cup. The roots go down, the plant goes up. Nobody really knows how or why, but we're all like that. Goldfish and hamsters, white mice, even the little seed in the styrofoam cup, they all die. So do we. And then remember the Dick and Jane books and the first word you learned, the biggest word of all, look. Now your creed might not be that creative, but he did that over a period of years and finally got to the point of how do you write it out? How do you share it in a way that's meaningful? So be creative with your creed. You just don't have to do the rote kind of things that happen in some of those creeds you'll read in the back of the hymnal. They're kind of just ticking off. This is what I believe about this. This is what I believe about that. What is it you believe? What is a belief about God? Who is God for you? How might we look and see what that says to us, what that says about us? The creed begins by saying, I believe in God. 
I hope we can all agree with that. As I say, there are some that don't. And there's some that you know who don't. And what do you say to those who don't? Well, you can say that I do, right? I do believe in God. And you can share your creed. Tell them what it is about God that you believe. As a pastor, I get a conversation every once in a while with somebody who honestly shares with me that they don't believe. And so I remind them what I believe. I believe that God believes in you. Okay? You may not believe in God, but God believes in you. Okay? I believe God who created all of these days, created them for a purpose, much like the last sermon series that we had from uh, Mike Slaughter talking about daring to dream a God-sized dream. God had dreams for you. God believes in you. And God believes you're going to do something with the belief you have in yourself. I am who I am because God believes in me. I am who I am because others down through the ages have believed in me. My parents believed in me. Teachers believed in me. Professors, I guess, believed in me. Bishops have believed in me. Congregations have believed in me. And so the things that I do, the things I enjoy doing, that we do as a congregation and a community of faith, I do because I know God believes in me. And because of that, I believe there are things that I can do for God. And it really does. It comes down from these six days of creation, because as you read through them in Genesis chapter 1, you see a day ends and God will say, and it was good. Right? Until you get down to the, the sixth day and then God creates people, God says it was very good. I still believe that. You know, There may be days when I see the news and all the bad things that are out there and you think, oh man, that's not very good. We just don't see all the news of all the good that a lot of people around the world do do each day. And it's my hope that I do a little good each day. In the mornings I get up, and I look forward to the day and the things that I can do. And I write down a list of things I want to do, hope to do. Get some of those done by the end of the day. There's always some left over for the next day. That's a part of my theology of not kicking the bucket yet. You know, I can't go just yet. I still have things to do, God. Right? But think about it. Each day when you put your head down, what good did you do today? Did you do something good? And if not, Will you do something good tomorrow? Give thanks for all the good things that you experience. Give thanks for all the good things that God has done today. Each day, may we experience the goodness of God as God shared it in those first six days. Sometimes when I'm talking with people who don't believe in God, I say, you know, one of my favorite scripture passages comes out of the first letter of John chapter 4 I usually just give them the short version God is love right but there's a fuller verse there oh I guess I forgot to push my buttons that's all right yeah in the beginning we got that okay yeah oh there's Hamilton's book you know I'm getting by it or, or some are going to study it right I think you're, you're doing Sunday school class with Sheila going to look at what Creed has to say and that's what it is I believe in God no, right. yeah all right God is love. That's what it says. 1 John 4, 16, in the middle of that verse. We have known and have believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And those who remain in love remain in God, and God remains in them. Basically, what it says to me is God loves us. And God asks us to love God, right? That's the first commandment. Love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so if people don't believe in God, I say, do you believe in love? God is love, and God loves you, right? Just like God believes in you, God loves you. And as a church, I believe we're called to love. Love God, love our neighbor. So I can say to people, God loves you, and so do I. And I remember I had a bishop once who said, God believes in you, and so do I, and there's nothing you can do about it. It really isn't, no matter what you do, I still called to love you. I might not like what you did, it might hurt, but yet I still love you. God is love. And do you know that? You probably want to write that in your creedal statement. 
They didn't evidently know that back in the third century because it's not there. Right? But I believe in love. I believe in God who is love, who loves us. How might we live that faith? How might we share that love as we go through our life? Well, it also describes God as Father. There are lots of things, right? And there's some names about God and all the attributes of God throughout the Bible. Different words are used. Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, -H, four letters in, in uh, uh, Exodus when God talks with Moses. You remember when we talked about the burning bush? Moses wants to know his name. It's virtually a shorthand version of what it is, Yahweh. I am who I am. That's what God said, right? In the Old Testament, there's no sense of being father. That's a Jesus word. Jesus used the word Abba. We maybe know that one. Abba is father. But in the Old Testament, there were other things. God Almighty, creator, heaven and earth we hear about. But when Jesus uses the word Father or Abba, for centuries now, and including in this creed, that word gets used. And I don't use that word, but maybe you do. I've heard some of you pray, and often you pray to Father God. But I want to tease a little bit out from you, because it happened to me in my first year of seminary when I happened to be sitting with a classmate whose father was abusive. And she said, I just can't use that word. <laughs> there are people whose fathers have abandoned them. You want to, want to preach to a father God who abandons people? How is it that we might attribute some things to God that we think are personal for us, but yet very impersonal for others? And I don't know about you, but I'm guessing it's impersonal to you as well. You say, Father Almighty, come on, put your hands up. I know you do. Right? Sure, Father. I learned about father from my father, right? I'm guessing you did as well, or maybe a grandfather. How many of you ever, ever called him father? Who'd you call that guy? Father. father. No, daddy. Abba is not father. Abba is probably the word the Jewish children learn, much like we learn, dada, right, Abba. As, as an expression. And I think Jesus can use that word very intimately. Now, I don't want you to preach to a daddy God, okay? But, but that sense of intimacy and love, rather than the father God, you know, just wait till your daddy gets home. I don't know that anybody said that. Wait till your daddy, no, wait till your father gets home. Father was a punisher, right? Father would get home and you'd go out to the woodshed or something was going to happen. Yeah. And, and that's really an Old Testament understanding of God. If you're reading through the Bible with me as we're trying to work our way through, I'm in the midst of Leviticus, and God's saying, if this happens, you're to stone them. If this happens, I will, you know, punish them. And that was the God of the Old Testament that many people were afraid of. And Father God has that fear element for some people today. So I don't use that word. But find a word that's loving, that's intimate, that's caring, it can express what it is you believe about God today. That draws you close to that God. And if Father's the word that does that for you, then use it. If it's not, find one that does. And I struggle with that because I haven't found a good one to use yet. Also talks about creator of heaven and earth. Ooh, I have that one. All goes well. Ah, there we go. Creator of heaven and earth. It's kind of the macrocosm, right? A creator of everything. Well, that's fine. But it's not very intimate, right? It's not just God that created everything out there. It's God who created me, right? God who cares about me, not just about the big stuff, but the little guy, the little gal. God created you. And so I want to talk about how it is we can help one another to grow in our faith. And what I wrote down for this year, I believe in God, a loving parent of all, creator of both the vast universe and intimately each one of us. What is it you believe? I want 
encourage you to think about it and write it down. If you want to get a copy of my sermon, you can see what I wrote. But write down what you believe. Again, it might be a struggle like Robert Fulgham talked about in his book. It might go on for pages and pages and pages. It's way too long. But see what you can do to boil it down. The crux of the story, the, the, the essence of what you believe about God. And let's share that with one another. Encourage one another to discover who is God that you really believe in. And then I want to talk a little bit about belief. I think I got enough time. Yes, okay. So again, there's probably different words that you use. At some point in time, you might say, I know. Right? I know something. Maybe it's not 100%, but it's 99.9%. .9%, okay, I know that. And until somebody proves it wrong, you just know it. I mean, for millennia, for centuries, people knew you just couldn't fly, right? Until Orville and Wilbur Wright proved them wrong. And then they have to say, well, I guess you can fly, right? But what is it that you know? And I'll remind you that we may not fully know everything we think we know. But below that somewhere, there might be some things that we think, right? I think that, you know, I think that. I, I might be wrong, but I think that's right. And then somewhere there's a belief. Belief isn't, I know it for sure, it's 100%. I don't know where belief is for you on that scale. It's definitely above unbelief or I don't believe. But it's kind of like, you know, I'm not real sure, but I believe. And so there was a man in the story in Mark chapter 9 who comes to Jesus wanting him to heal his son, concerned that Jesus just can't do anything for his son. And so he asks him, if you could do anything, will you help my son? And so Jesus said to him in verse 24, if you could do anything, all things are possible for the one who believes. And that the boy's father cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe is an accurate statement for all of us. I believe, but yet I have some doubts. I believe, but yet I have some unbelief. I believe. How can we help people to strengthen their belief and overcome some of those unbeliefs, those doubts, those fears? I think that's part of our journey from now until Easter as we look at our creed and begin to believe. In the Middle Ages, this period of time during Lent was a time for uh, people who maybe were thinking about becoming a Christian who would, would, you know, be looking at their faith, growing in their faith, getting ready, learning, you know, and, and the same way with confirmation classes, you know, kind of learning to get ready to make a profession of faith on Easter. And maybe we're going to do similar to that. We will we'll ask us to continue to ask the questions, what is it you believe? But I like what Jesus had to say. All things are possible for the one who believes. All things are possible for the one who believes. If you believe, it's like that little engine that could. I think I can. I think I can. I believe I can. I believe we can. It's amazing what we can do if we believe that we can do. You may be familiar with the philosopher Rene Descartes trying to get a handle on what it was that he understood, right, as a, a, a philosopher, as a thinker. And he boiled it down to, I think, therefore I am. I am because I have a brain that works and I can think. And because I can think, I know I am. I, I similarly turn that around and say, I believe, therefore I do. <coughs> I mean, I do a number of things, but I do them because I believe. I believe it's going to be a good thing to do and it'll benefit to somehow the world, somehow to someone by doing this. So I believe. I believe we can do something about that and therefore we do something about it. So put your faith into some action. Just don't sit there and say, yep, this is what I think, this is what I believe. So what? So put your faith into some action. Tell someone what you believe. Maybe somebody who's doubting. Maybe somebody who needs to hear it. Maybe somebody who doesn't feel loved. Let them know God is love and God loves you. 
Someone who doesn't believe, God believes in you. I believe in you. What a powerful statement for someone who's doubting, for someone who's afraid, someone's unsure. We have an opportunity not just to think of our faith and write it down on a piece of paper, but to actually live it and believe it. That's why I wrote these words. I believe in God who believes in me. God is the creator of everything I see. I believe in God almighty up above. God is very personal. God is simply love. I believe in God who believes in you. God has given you gifts to do what you can do. I believe in God. Tell me about you. How might my faith help you to believe too? Hallelujah. Kyrie eleison, much like the creed this was written in Latin, this is in Latin, right? Um, Lord have mercy is the definition, Kyrie is Lord, eleison. <coughs> oh, I can all stand at the base section. <laughs> Both didn't move the camera, I'm off camera, that's all right. They don't need to see me. those concerns that we have that we might lift up in prayer. Yes? The health of our choir members we're <laughs> about half of them this morning. number of choir members, yeah, Texas choir members just let us know that they were not doing well. Um, and then Matt's lifted up before. Matt yes. Keedy had a hard time last night. Just wasn't able to sleep in a lot of pain. And Jack is trying to take care of him. So please, uh, prayers for them and for others. Bob and Barb, uh, birds all likewise been kind of under the weather. Do want to share with you, I know I've shared it with some, but you may not all be aware, they have sold their house. They are moving to Idaho. Uh, March the 10th will be the last Sunday they will be with us, and I'm uh, planning a service that we can say farewell as a part of that. 
but, but pray for them <coughs> in that time of transition, of boxing up things, deciding what to keep, what to get rid of, and, and to say farewell to friends that they've come to love and move to a whole new state. Different time zone, I know. <laughs> All right, what else? Um, in addition to their uh, loss of their, their personalities, we're also bringing up holes in the choir and the bell choir. So okay, so like we're praying for new here. choir and bell choir members. Thank you. What else? Who else are we lifting up in prayer? George? Uh, the joy that uh, winners, I think, three quarters over. <laughs> Winter is three quarters over. I believe that. Yes. Don't know that, but I believe that. Thank you. Yeah. Winter is on its way out. Uh, I have seen some flowers. I mean, it's the snowdrops, which come up early, even sometimes in the snow. And daffodils are about yay high uh, by my condo. There's no yellow flowers yet, but the greens are tall. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and a little bit of snow dusting, but hey. Uh, two joys. One, our daughter successfully moved to Erie, Pennsylvania. She's finding her new roots there. Okay. And yesterday, our son purchased an engagement. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Did he give it to the girl yet? No. Okay, so keep it quiet in case you didn't. <laughs> yeah, but at least he's got the ring. So life is moving on. Yeah. Life is moving on. That's a joy. What else? Yes. I'd like to say a joy for Lynn's successful neighbor. Good, good. Is she down teaching Sunday school this morning? All right. Hey, all right. Very good. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's been a long time, but she's come through. This is right the right time, right in the middle of winter. That's a good time to recover. Now it's spring, she can get out and enjoy it. Yeah, Don. I would uh, like to ask for heartfelt prayers for my cousin Will. Uh, Will is almost 70 and um, suffers from severe depression, very suicidal. Um, he was homeless for seven years. Um, thankfully, the veterans, he's a vet, put him in a nice home. And uh, I uh, decided back in July that he and I would get together once a month for yeah. just <coughs> to share a meal. And uh, I brought some other cousins on board for that Good. gathering. Yeah. And sometimes I feel like it helps, and then there are times where I feel like we're taking many steps backwards, and Will needs our prayers. His family, his immediate family, is not interested in being around him, so that's why I've enlisted the help of the extended family. Extended family. family. Thank you for doing that yeah. and for sharing that with us. Let's keep him in prayer. And you as well in the family. Well, there are probably other prayers, you know, on your hearts. And let's take a moment in silence and just come before God. And let's pray. Oh, loving God, we come before you and we do give thanks for the blessings, the joys in our lives the healings, the hope, things that we share with one another, those things that touch our hearts and our lives, those things that are good. But today we come lifting up also those hurts, those pains, those struggles that we and those around us, those that we're lifting up in thought and prayer today. Holy God, walk with us today. Speak with us today. Help us as we reflect on what we believe about you. Why it is that we believe that about you. What is our experience of you and how might we share that with others? Bless us in this journey of faith we're on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time then we will take our morning offering. There it goes. Oops, we went too far. We'll back up later. All right. Is there anybody going to help me? There's George. Thank you.
please stand as you were in. honor God by lifting up our voices together as we pray our prayer of dedication. Abba God, God, as, as our adopter, adopter, you bring us the provisions we need to sustain us throughout our lives. Not just physical necessities, but also love, grace, and forgiveness. Today we bless you with this offering to show our appreciation for how you bless us. May this gift to you be used along with the gifts of our personal ministry efforts to build our kingdom and to ensure that others also hear the wonderful news about Jesus Christ. It is in his name we lift up this prayer. Amen. Amen. Let's join together in singing God of grace, God of glory. with one another. Thank you. 